Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to see you all here. It's great to welcome you to the UCL Institute of Education. I know uh, some of you have come from uh, near, nearby, some of you have taken flights and we've got people from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, from many different parts of the world. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you all here today. My name's Tristan McCowan. Uh, together with Rebecca Schendel, uh, I'm uh, the convener of the conference. Um, this is the Center for Education and International Development uh, 2018 annual conference. Uh, we'll hear more about the center shortly. Um, just a few things before we start, which I, I need to say about safety. Um, we're not expecting a fire drill today. Um, so uh, if you do hear the alarm, please exit through um, either one of the two doors. Uh, please don't use the lifts. Um, and go up the stairs to level two where there's an exit um, and the fire marshals will give instructions on, on what to do then. Um, please come and ask me at any point in the conference if you need any assistance finding places. I'll come back in a few minutes to say a little bit more um, about the programme. But it's my huge pleasure to um, ask Professor Becky Francis, the director of the UCL Institute of Education, uh, to say a few words uh, about the Institute and the event. Thank you. A very warm welcome to you all to the UCL Institute of Education and of course to those of you who have travelled from outside the UK to be here, a very special welcome to London. I really hope that you'll enjoy both the conference and your time in the city. And I must congratulate the conference organisers for such a stimulating programme. It really does look an amazing day and a really brilliant richness and diversity of presentations. Um, the topics are in, just incredible in their breadth and depth. And I really congratu congratulate all of you um, from the power of the keynotes that have been drawn together today, right across to, um, e you know, I was looking at even the poster presentations just look absolutely fascinating and stimulating. So congratulations to all of you and I really hope that you enjoy the day. Now it's been a fantastic year for the IOE Centre for Education and International Development, or SEED as we call it colloquially. From its lecture by the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, to Moses Akech's professional, pro professorial lecture, to this conference of course, among many other contributions to public debate and understanding. And that's not to mention colleagues' research and teaching and the vital contribution that makes to well-being, social justice and economic prosperity. So a little bit about the institution in which SEED sits. Now the Institute for, of Education, the IOE as we're known, was established back in 1902 as the London Day Training College for Teachers. And we grew in that capacity and then from the 1940s began to expand our research activity and links internationally. In 1977, we moved to this iconic building, which, believe it or not, is a, a, an iconic uh, representation of the British modernist movement. Uh, to most of it, we refer, most of us refer to this as concrete brutalism. Uh, that's how it's otherwise known. Um, in the last 20 years in particular, the IOE has emerged as a research powerhouse. I believe that we're the largest faculty of education internationally um, and the breadth and depth that we bring to education and um, areas of related social science is really very powerful. In 2014, of course, we joined with an even larger research powerhouse, UCL, and as a faculty, we're pleased to have been ranked number one in the world for education for five years running in the QS rankings. At the IOE, we cover all phases of education, formal and informal, from early years right through to workplace learning. So we cover the nuts and bolts of schooling in our work on curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, and we remain a major provider of teacher education as well, one of the largest providers of initial teacher training in England, training over 1,300 teachers a year. 
In social science, we house three internationally renowned birth cohort studies, which are tracking individuals through their lives. And there's also extensive work on children and families and health and well-being. And we've got a big uh, a strand of research on systematic reviews and the development of national guidelines in healthcare. And that's been joined by work on how best to support evidence-based policy and practice in education and other social agendas that include uh, health. Education and international development is, of course, another significant area of teaching and research for us. As you'll know, SEED is itself the largest community of scholars, students and alumni focused on education and international development in a single institution in the UK. I've already mentioned a few of SEED's successes this year, and you'll hear more about the centre from Elaine Unterhalter in a minute. As with much of the IOE's work, the focus is on both national and international. So to take a theme of today's conference, as well as SEED's research on HE issues, the IOE itself is also home to the Centre for Global Higher Education, which examines trends and issues for, the, for HE systems here in the UK and around the world. And the University of Cape Town is one of the Centre's partners. It's also important to note that our merger with UCL has reinforced our interdisciplinary work across pretty much all of our research areas, from work in the main curriculum subjects to atypical development and special educational needs, language development, and of course, again, international development, where SEED is a vital part of that mix. So today's conference is just one example of the role that SEED serves in furthering a dialogue on key issues in relation to education and international development. And crucially, that dialogue includes not just academic researchers, but also policymakers and practitioners in the international development field. I'm really delighted that the IOE is serving that role. It's something that we aim to do more of across all of our areas of scholarship. So thank you again to the organisers. I must mention especially Rebecca, Tristan and William for their brilliant work on this. And thanks again to you, our speakers and delegates, for joining us today. Can I once again just wish you an enjoyable and stimulating conference and now hand you over to Elaine. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and um, can I add to Tristan and Becky's very warm welcome on uh, behalf of SEED, the Centre for Education and International Development, um, which I co-direct with Professor Moses Oketch. Um, as Becky mentioned, SEED was launched um, last year, in June last year, with aims to investigate education and international development. Um, looking at the contribution of education to social justice, equalities, peace building, health, well-being, gender equality, and women's rights. And we aim to do work that is um, theoretically rigorous, methodologically engaged, um, concerned with um, data and critical about data and the context in which data are produced. We've been very aware that international developments like education is an idea and set of practices with many interpretations. Uh, our focus is on work in and with colleagues in Africa, Asia, Latin America and the Pacific and it's connected us with many versions of that relationship. Some good, some bad, some ugly, some maybe with the potential to become beautiful. Um, in SEED, we're a relatively large body of researchers and teachers, um, 30 members of academic and professional staff, 200 postgraduate students, and a large network of people interacting with us through seminars, workshops, research projects, blog exchanges, and all kinds of creative collaborations. In our work, we're acutely aware of the many ways in which current education systems and practices can fall short of the ideals SEED set out to work on. Education and international development as a disciplinary field is intertwined with histories of colonization, dispossession, exploitation, missed opportunities, and perverse policy effects 
as much as with the efforts of people to try to bring about change to, that lead to more equalities and justice. Um, the location of education and international development within higher education institutions, which is the theme of this conference, and Tristan's going to talk a bit more about that in a minute, has enhanced some of the possibilities for critical and self-critical work. But higher education is also a sector subject to numerous constraints, political and financial pressures, and implicated in many facets of inequality and exclusion. I know we're going to learn a lot more about all these themes today and many more in the presentations and discussions, and that's why it's so wonderful to see you all here. When we launched SEED last year, we undertook to hold an annual conference. I think it's relatively easy to think up a good idea like that um, when you're beginning something new, but it's a much harder task to bring them to fruition. And in welcoming you all, I wanted to acknowledge that you've all had di direct experience in lots of emails and pre-conference meetings of the wonderful organization that um, Tristan and Rebecca and uh, William have affected and the way in which they've been so ably supported by students and other colleagues. I really wanted to give very warm thanks to them for their hard work and really exuberant creativity around the conference and their good humor under lots of pressures, which I know lots of people have experience of organizing conferences, but it's, it's a hard part. Um, so I think this year's SEED conference gives, uh, theme gives us a very generative space to think together about some pressing contemporary issues. I hope for those of us who work and study in higher education, it's a chance to know ourselves and many others a bit better. And I hope we all have a good conference. And thanks very much for coming. Thanks very much, Elaine. So, uh, why did we decide to do this conference on, on the theme which we've chosen, which is higher education and international development? Well, uh, it acts as something of a follow-up to an event that we, we carried out amazingly four years ago uh, in 2014. Some of you may have been there. Um, welcome back, if you were. Which was on the same theme. It was a forum on higher education and international development, which was very much feeding into the debates that were fervent at the time around the Sustainable Development Goals which were agreed the following year and the, the new role that higher education would have in international development uh, in those goals. Quite a lot has changed since then um, in those years. Um, Britain, uh, or at least part of it, has, has decided that faced with uh, the new global order it would prefer to wind back the clock to somewhere around 1895. Um, Donald Trump uh, has finally, in King, <coughs> King Jong-un, found someone he can really relate to. Um, all sorts of global changes that have brought influences on higher education in relation to mobility, uh, funding, and a whole range of, of, of other areas. Some things have continued, uh, and the role of uh, higher education international development maintains what I see as a central contradiction uh, which is at the same time extraordinary success. So we're seeing a vast explosion of numbers go, of people going to university around the world. Um, huge increases in, in, in every region. Um, the, the, it's about a third of youth globally now that go into some form of, of tertiary education. Um, and, and also renewed support amongst international agencies, supranational organizations and national governments uh, for higher education. Not always translated into funding, but at least rhetorical support and uh, a number of new programs. And we're all familiar with um, the narrative around the, the changes from the 80s and 90s when, when higher education dropped off the agenda and, and the changes after, after 2000. So there is that positive side of the story, um, but at the same time, huge problems. And, and one of those problems is around equity. Uh, despite the vast increase in numbers, we're looking at a very, very uneven scenario. So we have about three quarters, if we're looking at the global enrollment ratios, we have a 
Figures are about three quarters if we're looking at North America and Europe. Something around half Latin America and the Caribbean. Down to a quarter when we come to South and Central Asia. Uh, and just 8% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're looking at vast global disparities when we're taking those big regions. We're also looking at huge disparities within countries in relation to social class, uh, gender, region, language, and so on. So there's a problem of equity. <clears throat> there's also a problem of the quality, the identity, the purpose uh, of universities. What are universities for, and are they achieving their aims? Um, are they, f if many countries, many universities sell the promise of enhanced employability to their prospective students um, who are then faced with poor learning outcomes and, and graduate unemployment and a whole host of other issues. So there are questions around what we know and there are questions about um, normative debated issues. And I see these as the two key reasons for holding an event like this. So the first is around evidence, generating more useful and meaningful evidence about around higher education systems. <clears throat> Back in 2013, um, Moses and Rebecca and I uh, conducted a, a large-scale literature review uh, around the impact of tertiary education on development. Uh, and we scoured, you know, vast databases, uh, and we were looking only at low and lower middle income countries. So that's, that's 84 countries uh, for the period of 1990 to uh, 2013. And we only identified with all those countries in that huge, well, relatively large time span, only 99 studies which actually provided rigorous evidence of impact of tertiary education and development which uh, was quite a relief given that we had to read all of them, uh, but not great for high, uh, tertiary education development uh, globally. So one of the things we're doing is to try and generate more rigorous research and the kinds of evidence that we need. But it would be a very dangerous, uh, it would be in a very dangerous place if we imagined that simply having evidence is enough to solve the problems that we have. Uh, we need to go beyond evidence and to think about some of those deeply contested normative issues around higher education that, that simply don't have technical fixes. And those are questions about who should go to university? Should everybody go to university? Should only some? Who should foot the bill? Um, what ultimately is the purpose of higher education? Um, what should be taught? Whose knowledge is it? Um, is the conventional university a Western construct? Should we be having diversity of epistemologies and so forth? All these are very complex but essential questions that, that, that we need to engage with. Uh, I hope that our, you'll find that our programme reflects both this need to produce new research findings but also to engage with these deep normative issues. We already started yesterday. Um, some of you I know were in the workshops. We had three workshops yesterday uh, on very interesting topics uh, around conflict, on migration and gender. Uh, we have the keynote coming up very shortly and I'll, in a moment I'll hand over um, to my colleague uh, Professor Moses Akech to introduce our, our keynote speaker who we're delighted to have here. Following that, after a break, we will have our, um, the f first of our two sets of parallel sessions. Uh, and the themes that we have for those are, uh, in the morning sessions, the role of higher education and development, aid, uh, access. We have a symposium on, on South African undergraduate education. Uh, I would like to say that you, you, you might find a lot of South Africa on this program. This was not... Uh, favoritism on the part of the organisers. We just had a lot of interest from South Africa. We're also engaged in some collaborations with South African colleagues. So we're, we're very pleased to have that very expressive cohort in, on our programme. The, the last session in the morning is on curriculum and pedagogy. Then we'll have the lunch break and we would invite you during the lunch break to, to uh, mill around the foyer with your food uh, and to look at the posters, we have a series of, of posters which are listed on the programme which are out, out in that part in the foyer. So please do go and speak to the presenters and find out about their posters. <clears throat> we then have the afternoon parallel sessions and they are on sustainable development goals, conflict, uh, a second uh, uh, group of papers on South Africa, 
uh, uh, on access and finally on research partnerships. If you're new to IOE, um, the, if you have a numbered room, the first of the numbers refers to the floor that it's on, and it's a little bit confusing because the ground floor is actually level four. Um, it's slight, if, you, if you don't want to get lost, you might want to take the lift. not quite so good for all of our health, but uh, if, if you're unsure of your way around, go up to the floor that's numbered, uh, and the rooms are fairly close to the lifts on that floor. The drama studio is on this level, just, just through there. Um, and the committee rooms are on level four, which is the ground floor. And they're, again, they're near this, this core of, of lifts there. <clears throat> we do have a small number of changes on the program. So if you, if you were very organized and downloaded it uh, weeks ago or printed it out, you might want to just check on the printed program today because there are a couple of swaps there. Just to finish off then, um, uh, <clears throat> it's really wonderful to see you all here um, for those people who uh, are presenting and also those who aren't presenting and we do have the final plenary session uh, where we very much hope uh, all of you including those who are not doing papers here will, will put forward your ideas, we have, will have plenty of time for, uh, for questions, we'll look, we've also have four invited guests who will be giving responses in that plenary session at the end of the day. Um, but we very much hope that the event of the whole, as a whole is, is more than the sum of its parts, that we, we really can create a space for, for dialogue here where we can create something during the day. Um, we very much hope it will be useful. We have some um, forms which are on the registration desk where we, we uh, invite you to tell us about how you found the day, what you found useful, so we can collect that information and, and um, hopefully uh, create something from it to try and synthesize some of the things that we've gained during the day. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the British Council for their support for this event through the University's Employability and Inclusive Development Research Project. Um, a, a huge thank you to um, William Nicholas who uh, managed the event um, and to everyone else involved um, and also to say please do come and find myself or William uh, or Rebecca at any point during the programme if you have any questions. Uh, I'm very pleased now to pass over to uh, Moses who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for showing up. Um, um, I'm quite delighted actually uh, to be given this important role uh, of introducing our keynote speaker today. I'm sure you're all anxious to hear about the good research that's been going on and to share the perspectives of higher education. So I'm not going to uh, you know, come in the way uh, on that. Um, um, I'm very pleased and very delighted actually to uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker today, Professor Teboho Moja, who is uh, coming to us from uh, New York University in the US. I'd like to say a little bit about uh, Professor uh, Moja's uh, background. Uh, Professor Moja obtained her PhD at the University of Wisconsin uh, in 1985. She joined New York uh, University in 1999 and is now a director and professor of uh, the higher education program at New York University. An extraordinary professor at the University of uh, Western Cape in South Africa and a visiting research fellow there as well at the Center of Advanced uh, Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria, also in South Africa. Uh, Professor Moja's career has focused on higher education policy research. Uh, she has published extensively on higher education and presented numerous keynote uh, addresses at international conferences on higher education issues. In 1991-92, uh, she became involved in the National Education Policy Investigation, uh, abbreviated as NEPI, a project uh, initiated by the Mass Democratic Movement in South Africa. The project's goal was to investigate policy options for the new government in all areas of education. In 1993, Professor Moja was appointed to the Center for Education Policy Development in South Africa as a policy analyst for higher education. The center produced policy documents and also proposed implementation strategies for um, uh, handover to the new Minister of Education after South Africa's first democratic election. 
Following the election, Professor Moja served as a special advisor to two ministers of education and was appointed executive director and commissioner of the National Commission on Higher Education. Professor Moja has served on numerous committees and boards of international bodies such as UNESCO and councils of university in South Africa and is the current chair of the board of trustees for the Center for Higher Education Trust, which is abbreviated as CHEP. Uh, Professor Moja's keynote today is going to focus on strengthening research for development uh, in the African context, a very befitting theme for the continent and for the conference today. And uh, she, of course, uh, has a vast amount of experience just listening to how she's advised the government of South Africa, her research uh, on higher education across the continent. Uh, if you, you know, look up her research, I think you gain a wealth of experience. So we are very delighted to have her to come and set for us the tone of the conference today. With those few remarks, may I please introduce, uh, welcome Professor Moja to the podium. Professor Moja. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, I'm still waking up, and I'm sure most of us are still waking up as well. Thank you, Professor Cage, for that generous introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here to be the keynote speaker for the conference, also addressing the topic on strengthening research capacity for the development in the African context. Well, in my presentation this morning, I will explore the development agenda that has been set for Africa and some of the issues that needs to be addressed for us to achieve those goals. And I will do that with particular reference to the research capacity development initiatives in place that could support that agenda. So my focus will be on some of those initiatives per se. Well, due to globalization, the neoliberal trends are promoting the notion of knowledge societies and knowledge-intensive economies. As a result, higher education has become crucial in supporting globalizing economies, very different from the early 60s and 70s per se. So higher education in Africa is also responding to some of the global pressure and has changed drastically in the past few decades in terms of its expansion, the way it's funded, the way it's governed, and productivity coming from the sector. African higher education is now considered a critical partner in economic development. The African Union has set and framed Africa's development agenda as informed by the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that have been adopted and elaborated on in Africa's Development Agenda 2063. This is a very broad time frame that will probably or definitely outlive some of the planners, but it does give us a framework, 2063 seems so far. The document mentioned here do mention and refer to the role that higher education would play, but this has been done disappointed, disappointingly in a very broad term and a lot has been left to interpretation. The role that higher education could play in African development is captured much better in another document referred to as a continental education strategy for Africa, commonly referred to as CISA. And its time frame is 2016 to 2025. Of all these policy documents targeting Africa's development, this is the one document that speaks directly about higher education's role in development. It specifically prioritizes research and innovation as a strategy for development. CISA 
reiterates the importance of quality knowledge production in order to enhance countries' competitive edge in the global process of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Its strategic objective, in particular objective number nine, specifically calls for the revitalization and expansion of tertiary education, of research and innovation to address continental challenges and promote global competitiveness. By the way, in, in my observation, there are so many of the reforms that are always calling for the revitalization of higher education. The overuse of revitalization as a concept sometimes sounds more like getting desperate to resuscitation of the system. And I'm wondering when we will get to a point where we'll call for no resuscitation and rather a new and transformed higher education system that's relevant for Africa's development needs. There are Afro-pessimists who often refer to Africa as a dark continent, but Afro-optimists perceive Africa as a continent on the rise. Africa, to me, is a continent on the rise, as evident in its growing economies, with six of the world's 10 fastest growing economies this year being in Africa. And this is according to the World Bank data provided. The list, when you look at the list that's up on the board there, shows Ghana at a high percentage of 8.3%, Ethiopia 8.2%, Côte d'Ivoire 7.2%, Djibouti, Senegal, Tanzania, and so on. That gives us hope. And the economic growth for Sub-Saharan too has been reported as 2.4% in 2017, and the World Bank is currently predicting a further growth to 3.2% in 2018 and 3.5% in 2019. In addition, Africa's gross domestic product has continued to steadily grow since 1995 despite international economic and political turbulence. This is good news indeed, but also raises challenges in terms of how growing economies can be supported from the higher education perspective. This is a challenge because similar to other regions, Africa's education systems and sustained future economic prospects are inextricably linked. It is important to mention that in Africa, the private returns on investments in higher education is as high as 21%, which is the highest in the world. You can see on the board there, the private returns for Africa being the highest there. The private rate of return for the high uh, income economies is only 11.1% and 14.6% for all economies. There is data that shows too that a one year increase in average tertiary education levels would eventually yield up to a 12% increase in uh, GDP. And hopefully, this is a topic that will be elaborated on further in one of the thematic uh, panels on uh, the link between higher education and development. Another trend worth mentioning is that Africa has a large population with approximately 65% of the continent's cit citizens estimated to be below the age of uh, 35. If we look at that uh, slide, we see that there is a massive bulge of the youth and a future workforce that higher education has to take into consideration. 
Higher education therefore faces the challenge not only of providing the continent with an educated and fast-growing skilled human resource, but also a human resource that can support a knowledge economy. The acknowledgement that higher education as a sector is critical for development and the implementation of the SDGs and Agenda 2063 goals signals at least a political will to support the sector. There are already some indicators in this regard because there is an increased public investment in the sector, even though overall the financial support remains relatively low. But that is a positive move, at least as a start. Let us now turn our attention to the trends in knowledge production. Overall, Africa's past track record on knowledge production is not good, but it is gradually changing. When we look at that slide, can you find Africa? Well, this is the, what the visual situation was in 2001. Africa appearing as a thin slither in terms of scientific papers produced. And in using Castell's suggestions of the four functions of universities, it is obvious that universities in Africa have focused mainly on three of those functions, namely promoting ideology, selecting the elites, and training the workforce. African universities have performed, unfortunately, poorly on the last function, that is, the function of producing knowledge. Many factors, such as poor leadership and governance, politics, and low funding levels for research have resulted in low research activities and low knowledge productivity in comparison to other regions of the world. But currently, the tide is turning due to growing interest amongst governments in Africa and development agencies to drive development through research and knowledge production. Research productivity in African universities is improving, even though not as much as we'd expect, but it is happening. This slide, using data from the Web of Science, indicates a steady growth of publications between 2005 and 2015. I'm not sure whether the increase is due to better reporting and documentation or whether there, is, uh, there was a general increase or so. But looking at a study conducted by Mouton in South Africa, his study indicates that Africa's share of world publications has doubled between that period, 2005, at 1.5% in 2005 to 2.8% 2 in 2015. In addition to this data that uh, has been shown there, the Scopus database for peer-reviewed publications, the African Observatory of Science, Technology, and Innovation, indicates that publications output from the African region grew by 43% between 2008 and 2010, compared with the world average, which is much lower at 18%. This is good news, and therefore, it is important to note that higher education institutions in Africa are actually positioning themselves to become knowledge-intensive institutions. Given this background on the developments in African higher education, I would now like to address some of the initiatives meant to strengthen capacity in research and the consequent transformation of African universities to become more research intensive. In this presentation, I use the concept research intensive as opposed to research universities. 
The reason being that most universities in Africa would not fit the strict definition in literature of what is meant by a research university. As an example, even though in the US we have over 5,000 universities, only 334 are classified as research universities. Furthermore, these research universities are placed into three categories, ranging from research one to research three, based on the institutional levels of research activity or per capita in research activities. African universities wouldn't qualify if we were to use that as a parameter. We have uh, Olba and um, Balan in, uh, in that publication called World Class Worldwide, which did not include any universities for Africa, which is an issue for further debate at another platform. The common understanding is that research universities focus primarily on research, sometimes at the expense of teaching undergraduates, which is not possible to do in Africa with our youth bulge. They offer, those research universities offer degrees up to the doctoral level, possess infrastructure such as libraries, laboratories, and IT, employ high quality academic staff, generally holding PhDs, ensure appropriate working conditions, and select the best students available. Research universities are resource intensive and costly in terms of pricey scientific equipment and expensive IT. They also have access to global knowledge and highly paid professors. So using these global parameters, it is hard to find many universities in Africa that would qualify to be defined as research universities. But that doesn't mean there's no research happening in Africa. However, some universities in Africa have aspirations to become more research intensive, and there are initiatives to support them. These initiatives are driven from many fronts at the continental level, national level, and institutional levels. Thematic panel two might elaborate also a little bit on that. The continent-wide initiatives are unfolding within a context of the African Union's adoption of a development agenda, and that helps quite a lot. So at the continental level, the three initiatives I would like to mention and elaborate on. The first one, is an initiative by the Science Granting Councils, SGCs, in Sub-Saharan Africa, who are exploring partnerships and collaborations amongst themselves for the first time to enhance their capacity to address development agendas. As councils, these bodies are somewhat differently structured, of course, differently resourced, and legislated in different countries but they are working together and they've come to the realization that they are an invaluable resource for Africa's research and higher education research systems. The Science Granting Council's initiative, referred to as SGCI in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, aims at making sure that publicly funded councils work hand in hand with higher education institutions to build research capacity in their countries. The argument made is that those councils are strategically placed to transform the research culture of institutions. This is possible because the mandate and important roles are given in this broad terms, being to disperse funds for research and development, being to build that research capacity through appropriate scholarships and bursaries, being to set and monitor research agendas and priorities, advise on science, technology, and innovation policies, manage bilateral and multilateral science and technology agreements, 
and assess the communication uptake and impact of publicly funded research. So councils on the continent are also playing an important role in collecting, analyzing, and generating data reports on the number of postgraduate supported institutional research trends, research areas that are being generally supported, research infrastructure needs, and research outputs. This is valuable data, by the way, needed to inform policy to steer national systems of innovation in support of priority at national and regional levels. That data can be used to identify, motivate, and fund the strengthening of research gap areas and to determine the human capacity needs of a country. As a collective now that are working together, that data could be used to inform the decision-making processes of regional and continental bodies and to further monitor the strengths and weaknesses of Africa's systems and contribute to Africa's development. Councils are there to strengthen individual researcher excellence by internal research and grant management processes incorporate activities such as rigorous peer review and evaluation of grant proposals. These processes, based on competitive funding, when managed effectively and efficiently, offer first-line support to developing the scientific ethos of individual researchers and for preparing Africa's scientists for global competitiveness. The one area that has remained a challenge for these councils has been, a way, has been in finding ways to work together to fund strategic investments to support higher education research. Because of the way they are structured, they cannot put their money together to work together, but they can collectively share that data or so. So they are unable to address transboundary issues such as diseases, poverty, climate issues, food security, etc. But pooling their resources has been difficult due to individual country legislation and mandates. And it is for this reason that we need to explore other, uh, other strategies and explore the possibility of perhaps establishing something like an African Research Council, similar to the European Research Council, that is empowered to address transboundary issues. The European Research Council was established to strengthen European capabilities and actions in research based on existing national and European structures. So in my argument, I would say a similar structure in Africa would be in a position to mobilize international development funds and use them together with public funds to address transboundary problems. The second initiative that I want to um, mentioned here is an, in each, is an initiative that's university driven. This was launched at the 2015 Higher Education Summit in Dhaka and is known as the African Research Universities Alliance, Arua. The alliance includes 16 universities that are planning to collaborate and strengthen their research capacity in their search for relevance relevant solutions for Africa. They are the universities that are part of this uh, alliance or so. The organization as Arua has identified 13 topic areas that will be a focus of their 13 planned centers of excellence. And the first center called the African Center of Excellence for Inequalities Research has already been launched recently in May at the University of Cape Town. The focus of this center is to understand the drivers and consequences of inequality in Africa, a major issue in development in Africa. And as we heard this morning, it was also mentioned. 
the center intends to address the analytical and measurement needs that are required for policy interventions and civil society actions to turn the tide against inequality. The Arua Initiative parallels other work facilitated by the World Bank and the Pan-African University, an initiative of the African Union. The former has set up 22 centers of excellence in West and Central Africa and 24 in East and Southern Africa. A total of 46 centers have been established. The goal is to promote postgraduate training and research in key areas for Africa's development. There are also nodal institutes established in key development areas in the five regions of Africa by the Pan-African University with an emphasis on postgraduate training and research. The goal here is to increase the output of postgraduates and research from higher education institutions, especially in the crucial areas of science and technology. These two initiatives alone and several others are expected to change the research and innovation landscape of Africa over the next decade. The third and last example in the category is one that is driven by the Higher Education Trust chat that I'm involved with. This is a non-government research and advocacy institute established in South Africa in 1995. It is referred to as CHET, and it serves as a research-based knowledge resource and forum for interaction between universities and institutions, policymakers, and key actors involved in higher education. This center has developed a capacity to respond to higher education research and information needs because of its flexible and non-hierarchical management that uses modern information technology and a very large network of fellows and researchers throughout the continent. In 2010, Chad implemented a project called Herana. The project included an, uh, eight top universities in eight countries. Only eight were selected, and this became a 10-year research project implemented in three phases and concluded in 2017. Through the project, data on students, staff, and publications at African research universities from 2001 to 2015 was collected. What the data revealed was the poor state of research in the top universities, which was a surprise to most of the leadership in those institutions. The data served as a vehicle for peer comparisons on the continent as to whether these top universities in their countries were actually research intensive or not and what some of the obstacles were. This came as a shock, especially in comparing one institution to another, but comparing peers rather than comparing institutions in Africa with institutions from somewhere else. So, in the, phase, in the first phase of the study, it became very clear that a major problem facing university, university academics was research funding. Research funds from government, institutions, and development agencies were limited and often had a specified agenda for which funding was available. On average, the institutions surveyed in the project had available less than 2,000 US dollar purchasing power uh, parity per permanent faculty member. The only out outlier in this was the University of Cape Town, which had more than 30,000 US dollars per faculty member for purchasing power parity. And this 
was very clear in terms of uh, comparing the levels of funding with uh, matching them with the amount of publications that were coming from the, uh, from the institutions. So the ones with higher funding, with more publications compared with the ones that had lower funding levels. The second issue was that most research funding was based on national and even departmental agendas rather than on excellence and broader needs. Thirdly, there was very little funding that addressed continent-wide issues on a non-national basis. The study by Chet, referred to as Herana, the Herana study, collected this data over 10 years, and during that period, research production, as indicated through publications, you have the slide, indicated that there was an increase in the number of publications, with a disclaimer here that it is not a project that led to higher publications, but we suspect that there was better data capturing to give a better picture of what was going on that indicated from the beginning to the end of the project a growth, with Ghana and Makerere in particular doing very, very well. Data was also generated to compare publications, the next one, by individual faculty members in those institutions. So the results were mixed, and some institutions, as we can see, some of them are very high, like Cape Town or so, that already started high. The results were mixed, as some institutions showed an increase, while others maintained the same level of publications. The study's unintended outcome has been the reinvigoration of institutional interest in intentionally supporting research activities and documenting the research products. Participating institutions also benefited in capacity strengthening to collect and report on data, as well as in their ability to track and assess their engagement with external communities. There's more information on this on the, the chat website with the reports that shows the studies that were conducted. There is also, in general, a growing interest in involving the African diaspora in Africa's development. The diaspora has been declared to be Africa's sixth region by the African Union. There is a Carnegie project called CADIP, the Carnegie Cooperation Diaspora Fellowship Program, which has joined the call to enhance research capacity building on the continent. The project's focus has research support and postgraduate training and mentoring as two of its uh, top goals, with the third goal being curriculum development. This initiative started in 2013 and to date has managed to offer 335 fellowships. The goal, which is a very ambitious goal, is to expand the program to award 10,000 fellowships to African scholars in 10 years, and that translates to 1,000 scholarships or fellowships per year. It is interesting to note that even though these scholarships are being offered, the takers or the requests for these uh, fellowships are coming mainly from the private university sector due to the shortage of qualified faculty members and the keenness to embark on new research agendas. Another motivator for these newly established private universities is to put to trial new courses and programs compared to the old established public institutions. So that's the trend that we have observed with that. Let me now move on to point out issues that need to be addressed to make sure that our higher education systems are strengthened and supported so that they can play their role in contributing to development. There are indicators 
that knowledge production in the form of research and publication is increasing. However, in proportion to other regions of the world, our productivity is still very low. There are major improvements needed because Africa as a region still ranks low compared with other regions in terms of the gross domestic expenditure on research and development, on the number of researchers, and on the share of publications and patents. Higher education systems in Africa are being massified, as we know, at a very rapid pace. Numbers of institutions are increasing and enrollments have been expanded. But there are, unfortunately, only a handful of researchers studying the African higher education systems and the support is largely provided by external funding agencies. There are strong centers in other regions of the world, such as in Europe, US, China, and Latin America, that are studying their education system so as to provide data on how their systems are performing, while in Africa, a few programs are now emerging, but still limited in scope and support. The closest we come to addressing continent-wide issues is through conferences aimed at revitalizing higher education in Africa, where numerous speakers make presentations based on experience rather than research, and very little happens thereafter. I would argue that our starting point should be the strengthening of capacity of researchers studying the higher education system itself on the continent. This is because there is need for system analysts, policy makers, and institutional planners that will provide guidance in steering higher education to contribute to the continent's development. We need data on systems that would contribute to evidence-based decision-making by our leaders in the institutions as well as in various countries. The Hirana project highlighted this need as it started building that database to inform institutions on how they were performing and in comparing them to their peers on the continent. Funding is usually given as a main reason why there's low knowledge production in African universities, but the Hirana project indicated that there is actually a double-sided problem. On the one hand, pro the problem is funding, but even if more funding was to be allocated, there's likely to be less research activity because there are low numbers of students enrolled in postgraduate programs, pursuing doctoral degrees and postdoctoral degrees. Research is also hampered by poor supervision and graduation rates as well. There is growing interest in developing postgraduate education, especially the offering of research degrees and doctoral studies. The more graduates are produced at these levels, the more likely we are to increase our production of knowledge that is directly relevant to the continent's development needs. This requires that more of the, uh, of the current faculty members should be encouraged to obtain their terminal degrees, or the younger generation should be encouraged to obtain doctoral degrees. Because faculty members with doctoral degrees are likely to publish their work. The Herana study indicated there that uh, there's growth in terms of publications produced by faculty members with doctorates as opposed to those without. And continent-wide, there is a need to develop a strategy to expand doctoral education enrollment levels to support emerging economies. The twin issue is research funding. There's still high dependency on funding to come from development agencies rather than from governments directly to higher education institutions or through mechanisms such as the science granting councils. However, research funding models are currently being reviewed and there is interest in mobilizing local resources through public-private partnerships 
to support research and innovation. Pulling together our limited resources, both financial and human, will surely yield more in terms of what can be achieved to address common issues rather than duplicating work at different places. For the implementation of the African Union's Agenda 2063, there is a plan where a resource mobilization strategy is being developed. The strategy is currently in a draft form and once finalized, implementation arrangements are likely to be put in place. There is also a capacity assessment study conducted by the AU, which is yet to be completed. When completed, measures have to be put in place to implement the capacity development plan for all uh, African Union organs and other implementing bodies or so. And the option for capacity assessment of member states are also under discussion at the moment. So in addition to the reviewing of strategies, we have the CESA document that I mentioned earlier, which also calls for increased funding of research and makes recommendation that research and innovation should be funded at least at a minimum of 1% of the GDP. There are, of course, many initiatives not mentioned in this presentation that are all working towards the goal of enhancing research capacity. Some might be presented in other sessions today, but I want to conclude by mentioning that the calls for adequate funding, overall support for research, and the setting up of centers of excellence by various stakeholders including government agencies, gives me hope that Africa as a continent might be finally on the path to deliver on its development agenda. And with that, I thank you all. Well, that is quite stimulating and, uh, you know, a whole terrain of uh, the challenges, opportunities uh, for higher education in Africa with relevance to other parts of the world. Would that require another round of applause? I think uh, I've, I've, I've enjoyed uh, uh, the rich data that builds up the argument. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Moja, uh, for that stimulating uh, keynote uh, to us. Uh, we have a few minutes, uh, so I think I'm going to welcome um, some questions. Uh, if you have comments uh, uh, for our keynote speaker uh, before we can uh, take a coffee break. So the floor is open to you for uh, any aspects of the conversation that has stimulated your mind. Maybe I can take three and then we take another round of three. So I saw a couple hands. So I see a hand here. I'm seeing another one there. And uh, where is, is there a third one? And there's a third one here. So let's take those three. Yeah, thank you very much for an engaging uh, presentation. My question relates actually to what you mentioned last uh, and referring to the funding for research coming mostly still from development agencies, development cooperation, uh, in, in organs, forms, whatever, uh, rather than from governments. Uh, and then you also added that uh, you're looking at private, public-private partnerships um, my question is, how do you see the funding as coming mostly from development agencies influencing the research agenda? Shall we take another one here, please? I'm very interested. I was interested you didn't directly mention the role of international partnerships, uh, particularly in the rise of the, the, the role of international partnerships, particularly in the rise of the publication output and the citations. It's been a very powerful strategy. And, and the third one there, please. Thank you. Um, again, I'm here for some um, You mentioned some really interesting ideas. One of them was uh, potentially the African Research Council, and the other thing was the, the large number of, of uh, postgraduate or perhaps doctoral scholars. I think you said 1,000 a year. Um, could you tell us about the mechanisms by which 
that that might work, right? Like the DERC here, at least they, they claim is just based on the capacity of science um, alone. And the, uh, they will fund projects only on the basis of the quality of the scientific project. However, the European Union also has other um, research um, funds that, that are uh, judged with some political considerations, right? Like, for instance, regional distribution and so on and so forth. So could you, could you speak to that in terms of how the African Research Council in Norway might work and how these 1,000 scholarships uh, a year might be distributed? Let's hear Professor Moja's perspectives on those three questions then. If there's time, we'll take another one round of questions. Um, Okay, starting with the first question where you mentioned the fact that uh, there's this call for increased funding, uh, GDP, uh, funding up to 1% of the GDP to be used for research and development or so, and how the public-private uh, partnerships might work in funding this. I think some of the work that has been done to explore to look at where other countries get monies from for research, we have come to realize that in the African context, we really have the private sector playing a very minor role in funding research, particularly in our institutions. And um, that has become more of a practice that uh, the private sector doesn't fund research, but they're the consumers of research that comes from there and we need to re-establish confidence with the private sector to say that could you also play a role in supporting some of the research that gets to be done in the universities rather than research just done in the laboratories linked to the private sector or so. So these are under discussions to say, let's develop strategies to really get money from our own local resources because linked to the other question as the, the international partners are getting exhausted of funding from outside without seeing the local resources also going into funding the agenda. I know I, I, I've partnered and worked a lot with some of the foundations in, uh, the, uh, based in the US. And one of the first questions they always ask is how much money are the locals putting into this area that you have identified as being important, and most of the time there's nothing, not, no local resources that are being put in that. So we need to really develop those strategies. How do we bring the other partners to the table to be part of uh, funding Africa's development for that benefit as well? And uh, the question that came from then, you mentioned that I didn't mention the international partnerships. Yes, it's an omission because there was so much to cover. And uh, what I can mention, the international partnerships have worked really, really well. And there's data that I didn't show here that shows that some of the increase in publications, actually, it's publications that are joint publications with international partners, so those tend to get cited more than publications that are produced and published just on the continent per se. What has come out, out of some of the data that's interesting is that there's very little joint uh, publications amongst African scholars within the continent. If I was to show a map of that, you'll see that in terms of partnerships, African scholars are cooperating with other scholars outside, but are not cooperating amongst themselves within the continent. And there are various reasons for that, some of them being that then the work doesn't get cited, it's not visible or so, but the benefits being that there will be partnering and producing relevant research for the continent, so having to weigh the two in some ways or so. So if we could get both ways, that would be fine. International partners are still active. You mentioned IDRC. IDRC is very active in the initiative I mentioned, the Science Granting Councils initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there are partners that are still coming through, that are still working, but there's also a funding exhaustion that's sort of getting there that uh, international funders are not so keen 
to find that. The third uh, idea that I brought about the African Research Council is an idea that uh, I have mentioned several times. And the African Union had also at some point, I understand, come up with that idea, but it didn't go very far. So I strongly believe in it, and I feel that uh, that's something that has to be promoted to actually address the transboundary issues and also to address um, the disparities in funding that go that's going to some countries and not others, that if money was to be brought into a council like that, and the projects are projects that are transboundary and benefit even countries that normally do not get uh, external funding, then that would work uh, much better. The African Diaspora Fellowship Program, there is an organization that has been set up called CADIF, C-A-D-P-F. It started as Carnegie African Diaspora Program, but now it's um, changing to be much broader. Originally, it was just for uh, African scholars in the US coming back for short periods of time onto the continent to work with our colleagues locally to help them mentor, support doctoral education programs, set them up or so, publish jointly or so. And now it's being ex expanded to uh, broaden it up to include Europe, to include China, to include other regions of the world and uh, with monies being collected from sponsors that are based there. The project has worked so well in the last few years that it was launched that uh, the Greek government also emulated it and based the model completely on this uh, project. It is administered by International Institute of International Education and uh, they helped them set up a similar project to get Greek uh, scholars in the diaspora to go back and give back and have some kind of brain circulation because you're not going to force people to go back, but they feel comfortable going back. And they do not have to go to their countries of birth. As well as they're African scholars, they can go to any of the other institutions. And very interesting work has come out of that that we have looked at in the last two, three years. Thank you. I think we, we can take another one or two. If there is a burning question, we have time for about uh, one or two questions. Anybody who has um, something you want to ask, clarification, comments? We've got one hand there. Any other one? I think we have touched. So we've got two. We can take those two. And then the plenary session, and then during coffee flow, you can follow up on a number of issues. Thank you very much. Thank you to Boho for a wonderful presentation. Just the point you made about the African Research Council, as you mentioned about eight years ago, a divided Lukosh and his team tried to put together a concept note, and they did a great deal of work to try and get such a thing in place. Do you possibly know why it was founded and what needs to be done to get it going? Thank you very much. And another one here, please. Please raise your hand. Raise your hand, yeah. Good morning, uh, Kate Cooper. I have a, a question with your CHET hat, your CHET hat. Um, what do you think will be the impact of the free higher education uh, in South Africa on uh, research and, and uh, postgraduate education, given that there is a capital constraint uh, in higher education budgets? Uh, so interested in your view on that whole process and, and your thoughts about it. Yeah, thank you. The African Research Council. I really don't know why this idea is not really selling. I think uh, it might. I, I tried uh, pushing it at the Science Granting Council's meeting, and that's where I found out that uh, it had come up and been sort of thrown aside. So, what does it take to make it happen? I think we need to keep on beating the drum that that's what's needed until people listen and pay attention to what you are saying. 
because I think it's a great idea that hasn't been given a chance to actually be explored further. Those same councils complain that they cannot really work together when it comes to putting their resources together. They can agree on the common agenda, but they can't use their monies across boundaries. So why not have a vehicle that will help them address issues with a common pot? So the more people are making noise about it, maybe finally governments will listen because I think it has to be approved at the level of the African Union. So we need to be advocating with our representatives there to really push the idea forward. The question about free higher education, <laughs> that's a big question. How will it impact research? My thumbs up guess is money is going to be diverted from research, from postgraduate training, to finding more of the undergraduates, which is a sort of a, a dilemma in some ways. There is need, obvious need that has been identified, but at the same time, are we going about the right way in doing that? Are we going to be able to come up with a strategy that's balanced, that we don't sacrifice one at the expense of the other? It reminds me more of those days with the World Bank policies that you get better investment returns if you invest in sort of basic education and not higher education. Why not both? So I wouldn't argue that we should do one at the expense of the other, but we should come up with a comprehensive plan of how we're going to maintain all that. Because we need those masses of kids getting uh, the higher education but at the same time, we need researchers being developed. We need a new generation of academics coming in to teach those masses as well. Also. So it was done in a haphazard way very quickly. And hopefully, we'll take time to step back and say, how are we going to really balance this out? Thank you. Thank you to Professor Moja. Thank you all for listening. Uh, there is one housekeeping uh, announcement by my colleague Tristan, but uh, thank you for the questions as well. So, uh, Tristan, please. Just to add my thanks for that extremely uh, stimulating start to our day. Um, a few things before you uh, grab some refreshments. If you are a Twitter user, please do uh, tweet about the events of the day. Um, you can see here, hashtag C2018, so that's seed, C-E-I-D. Um, if you'd like to use uh, Wi-Fi, uh, there is a, if you, you've, you'll find the network UCL Guest. It does take you through a series of, of rather irritating steps, but eventually you will get there. The code you need is seed2018, again. So it's the same, uh, it's written up there, C-E-I-D. Um, Please also be thinking of uh, ideas, comments, and questions that you'd like to feed in in the final plenary when we all come back here. Um, and uh, now we have uh, tea and coffee. Uh, please um, help yourselves. Um, it will be out in the foyers here, uh, where we also have the posters. Um, and if you're unsure where to go after that, um, do come and ask. Um, once the first parallel session is over at 12.30, there is lunch provided for everybody down here, so you don't need to, to go away and get your lunch. We, we have lunch for you here. Uh, and then um, at 1.30, we have the second of the parallel sessions. Um, so please join with me in giving a final round of applause, uh, round of applause for today.